That's what Christ was telling Nicodemus. Matthew 6, 33, I call it his priority. Christ's priority was not food and clothes and car and house and all the stuff that we go after. He says, but seek what? First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be what? Added unto you. He says, your priority should be seeking the kingdom. I did a research on the word seek. It's an amazing word. Matter of fact, in my book out there on uh, priority, uh, it's called Kingdom applying the kingdom, I did a, a whole chapter on seek because the word seek that he used is a powerful word. It means to pursue, it means to, 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 to run after, it means to study, to explore, to get to know. It's a powerful word. In other words, you don't just sit back in a meeting like this and say, well, I want to know the kingdom. You got to get up and go look for it, search for it, research it. Why? Because you don't just enter a country and know the country. If someone told you right now that you you should go to know America. Do you really know the United States? You don't know the United States. There's some parts you've never been. There's some mountains you never climbed. There's some rivers in this country you never saw. In other words, seeking could be a lifetime experience. Study, you know, that's why I'm possessed by it. I'm possessed by it because he said that's the only thing to seek. I was religious and in bondage. I owed everybody. And I would sing in every meeting, the Lord blessed me, the Lord loved me. And I had to go and deal with those people I owed money to. Man, it was pressure. And there are people sitting here today who may be in the same predicament, I don't know. Maybe you, you, you sing all these wonderful worship songs, you know, listen to the good preaching, and then you go back to a life filled with pressure. Can't pay your bills, can't get the scans out of your gut, your kids ain't going right, your marriage ain't working right, and you're still coming every week just singing these songs. Why? That's the way I was. And that's why we come up with gimmicks, because the thing ain't working, so we come up with gimmicks. And we kind of religiousize the gimmicks so that people could accept them. When Christ says, just seek the kingdom, and all these things will be added unto you. My debt-free life was not a result of religion. I remember, man, I, I used to come and, you know, you know, if you give God 10, he'd give you 20. You know, that whole stuff, man. Hey, I grew up around it. It doesn't mean that it doesn't work, but the motivation that you have for it negates it. You don't serve God to get stuff. <laughs> Citizenship attracts stuff. Can I say it again? Citizenship in a kingdom attracts the stuff. That's why it says it shall be added. You ain't got to go pursue it. It comes toward you when you line up with the kingdom. When you get baptized in a, in a public service, that's why baptism is public, because you are publicly changing schools of thought. You actually line yourself up to attract what you need. Baptism is powerful. Baptism sets you up for attraction. It's not a religious experience. It is a national experience. You're becoming a citizen. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow if you seek the kingdom. Do you know, uh, this is amazing. Remember I told you last night that wealth in the kingdom of God is not something you pursue? Because in the kingdom of God, wealth is spelled Access, A-C-C-E-S-S, -S, access to everything. My son called me this morning, woke me up this morning early. He said, Dad, uh, you know, he's in New Jersey getting interviewed for jobs. And he said, I just bought him a car and everything. So he said, Dad, uh, I, want to, uh, I want to know whether I should get full insurance or, you know, just liable insurance, etc." So I said, son, get full insurance. He said, okay. He said, I just want to know so you'll know what to deposit in my account. <laughs> That's important. It was a kingdom experience. The Bible says your father knows what you need. He didn't ask me for the money. He just told me what he needed. That's all. There's a difference. Oh, you missed it. He knew there was a father out there somewhere who got what he needs. Now, It'll be a stupid son to say, Daddy, give me $500,000, that's all I want, give me my portion now, I'm gone. Wow. When the 500 ran out, mm. 
He's in a pig pen again. What you want to do <laughs> is not have money, you want access. Hallelujah. Because Paul understood it. Paul says, if I have or don't have, I'm happy because it ain't a matter of having or not having. He says, my God shall supply all of my needs. Watch this, according to his. You see, in other words, I ain't got nothing in my pocket because that's, that's poverty. You can lose the car you have. Now you carless. But if you know God and you are a citizen in the kingdom and he knows you need transportation, you got a million cars. I remember Peter said to Jesus one time, Peter said, Jesus, I left all to follow you. I left my boat, my wife, my kids. I left everything to follow you. And he was really trying to impress Jesus. I left all to follow you. I left all to follow you. I left all I had to follow you. Christ says, shut up. No man leaves nothing for me, he says. Watch him now. He says, if you submit to me and submit to my kingdom, he says, I'll give you seven houses. That one you got even ain't enough. Oh, he was trying to get him to access. You thought you left your father to follow me, he says. I'll give you a thousand fathers. The kingdom is a different mentality. Here's one. This one is amazing. Matthew 10, verse 7. Read, everybody read, go. As you go, preach this message. Now, he's very specific. Because he knows you'll have your own messages. We're reading the Bible here. So, okay, you're in charge of the Bible school here, this church. My question is, is there a class specifically on what he said to teach? Or are you teaching them all kinds of other people's stuff? Get to read that. Read what he said. Don't argue with me. I mean, read the Bible, that's all. But the problem is, if the concept is not in your culture, you avoid it. And that's the problem. Kingdom is not in the culture here, so you, 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 you teach other things maybe because you don't understand the concept. That's why Christ would, would have me come into this, this event. This is word explosion. Word explosion means it's the place that people are supposed to come and get his word. So the question is, what word are they getting when they come here? And he says, you make sure they go with that message. My being here, it, no, listen, this, this is my vacation week. I'm on vacation, and the Lord says, go there. I said, but God, I'm tired. I've been working for eight months nonstop. He says, you tell Billy Joe yes. <laughs> Why? Because the message must be in this place if they claim it's going to explode the right word. I am not looking for anywhere to preach. I have one of the largest churches in my country, and they miss me every Sunday. I don't even be there Sunday. Why? Because I have to be out ministering, and, and they long for me. I'm on assignment. I am aware of who I am. And I wish God had chosen someone else to do this, because when you teach the kingdom, religion attacks you. Jesus Christ had no difficulty with sinners, no difficulty with, with wine bibbers and, and alcoholics. He, they were his friends. It was the religious people who hated him because his message clashed with religion. He says, you preach the kingdom. When you go, preach this message, the kingdom. You know, I have a theological degree from our Roberts University across the road. I got a degree in theology. And there was not one class on the kingdom. Am I rejoicing over that? It makes me sad. They gave me a certificate. They certified me to go and preach. That's what graduation is. They certify you. How can they certify me and never had a, a class on the message? We got to repent. What is repent? To change our thinking. As you go, preach this message, the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, and then show the evidence. Heal the sick, raise the dead, 
cast out demons. He left us. He says, why? That is the proof that the culture of the kingdom is present. You know, uh, I was just with Benny Hinn. We were chatting last week, and I was telling him, I said, look, do you know what your ministry is? You don't even show what your ministry is. Your ministry is kingdom culture. There it is right there. When, when a miracle takes place, it is evidence of kingdom culture being present. Because in the kingdom, there is no demon possession. There is no sickness, no disease. There is no leprosy. So when it hits an area, boom, everything that's not like it moves away. Your healing is going to be evidence of God's presence, of his culture in your life. That's why you will be healed today. You leave this room free from diabetes and high blood pressure and heart problems and all the stroke issues. Why? Because if you, if you understand, my, listen carefully to my words, the words can actually heal you. It's God's big idea. Let's read another verse. Again, I wanted to just read the Bible because some people don't, you know, don't get it when I teach the principles. Here's what it says in Matthew 12. He says, if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is on earth. Miracles are a sign that the culture of heaven is present. The kingdom is here. Here's another one. Matthew 13, 19. This one is very dangerous. Now, let me explain this verse. This verse is about a parable that you have heard a lot about. You've probably been preaching on it. You need to go back and read the parable again because I think, you know, when I was teaching this parable for years, I taught it incorrectly. Matter of fact, Jesus didn't explain too many of his parables, but this one he did. It's the parable of the sower. And we've used it for money, we've used it for all kinds of stuff. No, he says, read it, he says, let me tell you what the parable means. That's verse 18. Read verse 18 in your Bible right now. He says, let me explain the parable. That's verse 18. Let me say it again. Read it in your Bible so you can see it. They asked him, they said, show us the parable. This is one of the few ones he explained. He said, okay, let me explain the parable to you. But verse 18, this is what he said. When anyone hears the specific message about the kingdom and just begins to understand it, the devil himself comes to snatch it away. Are you getting this? If you preach on anything else but the kingdom, it doesn't excite the devil. And that explained to me why the kingdom message has been stolen from the church. The devil is so glad we ain't getting it because it's the only one he's afraid of, Jesus says. Notice, it didn't say he sends a demon. It says the evil one himself comes. Do you know I believe Satan right now is in Tulsa? He followed me here because he knows what I'm going to preach. And the Bible says he's, that's the only one he hates. Matter of fact, remember now, he's not God. He cannot be in more than one place at the same time. He's not omnipresent. So he, he, he will track where the kingdom is being teached because the last thing he wants you to understand. If you ever get that revelation of the kingdom, he loses control over your life. Tulsa is the center of the factories for messages for the church. And what hasn't come from Tulsa yet is the one the devil is afraid of. And that's why God has sent this message to this place, because this is a very important conference. It's called Word Explode. This is where the word is supposed to explode from. And God says, okay, I want the word of the kingdom to explode from here. Poof. That's why you're here from your job today. You left your job because God says what you're going to hear is more important than your job. I mean, why would Bob come here? Bob is influential. He has a powerful ministry. God says, yes, I want you to just adjust now and follow my instructions specifically. You know, we preach the effects of the kingdom instead of the kingdom. One of the effects is prosperity, healing, joy, peace, 
All them good things. We preach those rather than where they come from. That's why Christ says, don't seek food and clothes and car and house. He says, seek first the kingdom. Once you get the kingdom, those things become automatic. They are part of the culture of the kingdom. The kingdom will be uh, insulted if you are not prospering. Because prosperity is its culture. Let me just say one thing here because I want you to get this. I was born under a king in 1954. And here's what you experience under a kingdom. Can I say this? Please get the books on there, please. Get the whole set. You gotta, and, and please study it because you have to get it in your mind. A king is different from a, a, a president. If you can't pay your light bills or your water bill or your mortgage, or you even lose your house, some of you are losing your houses right now, President Bush really doesn't care. It doesn't affect the president. Company shut down, I understand, this past week in your country where over 200 people laid off. President Bush goes to bed in his nice bed. It doesn't affect him personally. Because in a democracy, you on your own. Watch this, listen carefully. In a kingdom, in the book out there on rediscovering the kingdom, I give you 26 specific principles of the kingdom. They're very important. That's why Christ is a king. Here's one of them. In a kingdom, a king's reputation is determined by the status and the standard of living of his citizens. Let me say it again. This is a kingdom principle. A king's personal reputation is determined by the quality of life of his citizens. That's important to understand. That is why you don't beg in a kingdom. It's an insult. That means that a king's reputation, and by the way, a king's reputation is what a king is all about. The name of a king is very important to the king. Name is not just a letter of words. Name to a king means his glory, his reputation. The Bible calls it namesake. A king has namesake. President Bush is not attacked by other countries because of the poverty in this city. It doesn't affect his reputation out there. But in a kingdom, a king is attacked based on the standard of living of his students, I mean his citizens, in his kingdom. So nothing can embarrass a king more than a poor citizen. A sick citizen is bad for the king's reputation. That's why kings have to have wealth. Their wealth is not for them. Their wealth is to protect their name. Oh, I can't understand it. Jesus needs no money, he don't need no healing, but he got it all to protect his name. He does it by making sure you don't need any money and you don't have any sickness. That's good for his name. That's why he says, I will heal you in my name to protect my name. Oh, I don't know how to teach this sometime. So when you don't have your needs met, don't pray for the things. Wrong prayer. He says, why do you worry what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear? He said, that's not what you pray for. He said, don't even take a thought of those things. But what you pray is what? Thy kingdom come. Why? You're telling him, protect your reputation. Oh, you missed it. You get a light bill, a water bill, a phone bill, a mortgage payment. Don't pray for the money. Just say, Lord, this doesn't make you look good. <laughs> clap, 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 clap. Come on, give God a praise, ma'am. He will meet your needs to protect his name. That's what kings do. A man born blind, and they said he was blind because his parents did something. He said, no, 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 no. no. That's a religious concept. He said, this man was born blind so that God's name would be glorified. God allowed this blindness to, to remain on him until I show up because I am the king. And I'm going to, to magnify my name. You know the word magnify? I'm going to make my name bigger by healing this man of something that's not in my culture. Lift your hands up right now. Everybody lift your hands up. Quick, quick, quick. Lift your hands up. Say, Lord, deliver me for what I'm going through for your name's sake. For your name's sake. 
for your name's sake for your name's sake for your name's sake and God says and I will deliver them for my name's sake give him a give thanks offering right now thank him he will do it hallelujah Satan doesn't want you to get this message. He can't wait for me to leave Tulsa. Because this is the only one he personally is afraid of. Read it. He don't send no demons to harass you when you hear the kingdom message. He comes himself. Here's a verse I thought was interesting. The Great Commission. What do we preach when we send missionaries out? Let's read it. He says, and this gospel remember now you got to de got to define what it was this gospel of what the kingdom shall be preached into the whole world there's your missions assignment no mission school should be absent of the main course you know my publisher called me the other day he said dr. Monroe we have seven seminaries who are ordering your books I dropped the telephone and I danced around my room. I was so excited in my office. And he said, what happened? I said, man, you don't understand. They're the ones who produce the preachers. If they get the message. Oh, when I was in university and college, in seminary, I had to read every word of St. Augustine. He was a Catholic priest. I had to study Brom. He was a German theologian. I read everybody except the kingdom stuff. Let me ask you a question. Would you finance the mission project of a Muslim imam? imam? Would you? Why not? Because you don't agree with his message. When you send money to support missions, what are they preaching is the big question. Read the verse again out loud. Let's read. Everybody go. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached into the whole world as a testimony to who? All nations. And when you do that, he says, then I'll think about coming back. Which means he ain't coming back right now because we even ain't got the message in our seminaries. God, why don't you choose somebody else for this job? Because I can feel the tension in your head. You know, what do you do? When you say you ordain someone, what are you ordaining them to go and tell the world? He says specifically what they should be telling them. We got, you know, it's amazing how we, in, in our charismatic movement, uh, we, you know, I'm a part of it. We got faith preachers, prosperity preachers, healer preachers, you know, anointing preachers, and preachers, but there's no kingdom preacher to be produced. And he said, when you go, preach this message. I hope I'm invited back. Because sometimes, you know, I really respect Billy Joe because when I delivered this last year, I went on praying. I said, God, why me? I want to preach what they like to hear. He says, look, you know the message. You preach it. Here's one. People say, well, what did Paul preach? By the way, if you have a, a, a uh, and all the students who are here, the students who are here, my computer students, 
I want you all to go to your computer, if you've got a computer Bible, and type the word kingdom in and press search, okay? And then go to the New Testament and see how it explodes. Paul only preached the kingdom, but we never see it. Why? You only see what you look for. Here's a verse. It says, they arranged to meet Paul on a certain day, and they came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying, from morning till evening. That's how long I got to stay here, folks. <laughs> From morning until evening, he did what? He explained and declared to them what? The kingdom of God. And then he tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses all the way up to the prophets. In other words, his, the kingdom is so complicated to teach, you can't just teach a 30-minute sermon. Why? You're explaining a country. You can't explain a country in 30 minutes. That's why Christ spent three days teaching the kingdom and the people food ran out. Why? You're talking about a country they never saw and lifestyle they never experienced. You got to explain that and that is so complicated. You need time to sit and think. Try and explain America to somebody. Tell me how long it takes. I got to explain to you the kingdom of heaven. Not a 30-minute sermon. He spent all day, all night. Look at this one. I thought it was interesting. Paul's passion. Acts 28, verse 30. This is Paul's last days on earth. He's about to die. He's under house arrest. And here's what it says about Paul. Read with me. Acts chapter 28, verse 30. Read. For two whole years, come on, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached. You ain't never seen that verse before in your life. That's the problem. You only find what you look for. Paul understood the kingdom more than Peter did. Because Paul was a citizen of Rome. Oh, glory, hallelujah. You remember when they were going to whip Paul? Yeah. And they began to whip Paul. Whoop! Whoop! Paul says, you know, I'm going to use my citizenship now. Tell your neighbor, I'm going to use my citizenship right now. When the devil begins to whip you, come on, glory, hallelujah, and begins to attack you, brother Bob, you got to pull your passport out and say, hey, do you know who I am? Come on, give God a shout. How dare this cancer come on my breast? Don't you know who I come on, sir? A lot of Christians have died unnecessarily because Christianity is a religion. It doesn't kick into rights and power. He boldly and I hope I'm doing the same in Paul's pattern. Boldly, without fear, telling them the kingdom of God is here. Boldly, he declared it. Why? He was fighting against religious people. And notice his greatest opposition was still the Judaizers, the religious group. They fought Paul, teeth and nail. Why? Because when you get the kingdom, you got to give him your religion. And it's hard to give up something You've fallen in love with it for 40, 50 years. So you come in the night. I'm going to hear that Miles Monroe. I don't want no one to know I'm going. Let me see what he got to say about this kingdom stuff. See? And so you sneak in, sit in the back, listening. Pharisee, this young fellow, who you think he is? Christ says, look, you cannot enter this except you become like a little child, teachable. Nicodemus had to give up all of his theological training. Let me close. I got much more to say to you now, but you couldn't take it. So let me just give you a couple of thoughts here. 
What is a kingdom? I thought I'd better give you this before we leave today. Write this down, everybody. What is a kingdom? Now, this is important for Americans to write down because there's no kingdom in your culture. What is a kingdom? A kingdom is the sovereign rulership or governing authority of a king over his territory, impacting it with his personal will, his purpose, and his intent. Producing a community of citizens who express the king's culture, nature, and lifestyle. That's a kingdom. I was born in one. In a religion, you follow rituals and you attempt to obey some laws. In a kingdom, it's different. In a kingdom, you take on the very personality and nature of the king. <laughs> oh, glory, hallelujah. I feel like running right around that day, just, just scream by myself. Listen to me. Brother Bob, that's why I love you so much, man. You, you trying to get people to understand, they got to change their thinking. Do you know, Brother Ron, that the king wants every citizen to dress like him, look like him, eat like him, because it reflects his name. Do you understand that? That's why you stop praying for money. You don't pray for money. You pray for kingdom citizenship. You remember, I'm sure you remember this, when, uh, by the way, uh, to, to understand the whole context, you understand what kings do. Kings compete with each other. That's important, write that down. Kings what? Compete. That's what kingdoms do. They compete for each other's glory. They, they, they like to outstrip each other's glory. That's why when a king sees another king somewhere, they go to visit them. You visit a king to embarrass him. This is very important. So when Christ says he's a king, they understood what he was talking about. Kings like to visit other kings to expose their weaknesses. That's why a king will never visit another king without taking him a gift. And the gift is normally a massive gift to embarrass the king. Because if I gave you a gift bigger than you can give me one, then all your citizens know that I am a greater king with a greater glory and greater name. And so you, when you come to a king, you take a big gift to embarrass him. That's how kingdoms work. So when the queen of Sheba heard that there was a king in Israel who was the most wise and powerful king, she became very insulted and said, wait a minute, I'm the queen of Sheba. I am the queen, the ruler of Africa. No one is greater than I. And so she goes to visit Solomon to embarrass him. And if you read the Bible, it says she bought a big gift. Thousands of cattle, thousands of sheep, thousands of camels, thousands of gold and shekels. She came, well, I came to embarrass him. And the Bible says, when they arrived in Israel, her big caravan with thousands of soldiers, all this wealth behind her, she's coming to embarrass this so-called great king. The scripture says, as soon as she entered, Sharon, the courtyard, her knees became weak. It said, because when she saw how the servants were dressed, shouting yet yeah. hallelujah when she saw what the servants were wearing the Bible says her breath left her and then when she got into the palace she saw what the servants were eating on silver plates gold fork she said my God if the servants eating on silver plates and golden fork I don't want to see the king no more The Bible says when she saw the meat on their plate, she knew 
she had entered the courts of the greatest king. And the scripture says she became weak and her breath escaped her. Of course, you know the story. She went in and she saw Solomon. And Solomon was real cool. Why? This is my culture, baby. <laughs> oh, Sister Sherry. When they tell you, you guys have personal bills? No. You driving that nice car? Yep. You look so nice? Yep. How come? This is my culture. This ain't nothing important to me. It's just my culture. I don't brag about my car. It's my culture to drive this kind of car. Why do I look so nice? It's my culture to look like my king. His name is what? Majestic. I got to look majestic. Come on, give God a praise. And the Bible says Solomon didn't leave her there. He opened his mouth. See, and boy, that was it for her. He blew her away. And the Bible says when she left him, she went back to her kingdom with these words upon her lips. They told me that he was a great king. They said he was the mightiest of all. But they didn't tell me the truth, she says. The half. Come on, somebody. Tell your neighbor, you ain't seen nothing yet. Hey, Brother Bob, tell them you ain't seen nothing yet. They think you rich right now. They think you got your needs met now. But the half. I say the half. Have never been told. She said, y'all didn't tell me the truth about those people. Y'all told me that they were blessed. But when I went in there and I saw their culture. I forgot the most important part of the story. It says that when she was about to leave, Solomon said to his aides, give her a gift. He said, he said, give her a gift. And the Bible says she was given seven times more. <laughs> she was embarrassed by his glory. God's about to embarrass you. Your little gift you gave God this morning is just going to make him angry. He's going to embarrass you with ten times more, a thousand times more. Let me tell you something, friends. This is why giving in a kingdom is in the giver's best interest. Oh, Lord. Oh, you missed that, you missed that, you missed that. When you are in a kingdom and you go to see the king, you must take a gift. But now, your secret key is to embarrass him. Attempt to embarrass him. Which means if you give him five dollars, it doesn't take much for him to embarrass you. He gives you 10. Some of you are going to get it after I'm gone. That's why the Bible says, if you give bountifully, you impact the king. Now the king got to give back to you bountifully. It's a kingdom principle. So if you give God a thousand dollars, now he got to embarrass you and give you 10,000 back. Then you give him 10,000, oh boy. He said, look, I got to embarrass you. He gives you 100,000 back. Now you give him 100,000, he said, oh, here we go again. I'll give you a million. He said, okay, I'm going to give you a million. God said, oh my God. Here I go, I'm going to give you 10 million. And you keep on putting pressure on it, putting pressure on it, putting pressure on it by raising the stakes of your giving. 